In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Galatians. And I want to go ahead and get straight into the scripture on this one. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, remember that at this particular point, Paul has been talking to them about this contrast between the old and new law. And he says in Galatians 5, 13 and 15, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love the neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So there is a wealth of information contained within those three verses. And it does help to remember in this context that Paul was specifically speaking to the churches at Galatia that were having struggles between Jewish and Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians wanted to implement ideas of the old law. The Gentile Christians were saying, no, no, you just get rid of all that stuff. You just live the way that you're supposed to. And the Gentile Christians were technically correct, but this was causing discord amongst the brothers. And that wasn't good. Even for the people that were right, it's not good to sow discord among your brethren. And so this is something that Paul gives a very clear format on, and this is something that's just, it's so indicative of who Paul is in his writing. Paul presents the problem. He says, here's what the problem is. Here is the solution. Here's how to implement the solution. And so doesn't waste any words in a very concise manner. He gives us problem, solution, how to implement the solution. So if you look back at that text, the problem is people using their freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, temptation, uh, binding different burdens on people, b binding the law on them where it's, not where it's not necessary. And then he says that this is happening, and the solution is love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple solution. And how do you implement that? Well, in the next verse, in verse 15, he says, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So, problem, solution, how to implement the solution. So, this issue that he's talking about where there were Jewish Christians trying to, to push the old law on them or people that were being involved in temptation because they had this liberty, Gentile Christians that were saying, well, since I'm under grace, I can just sin and it'll be fine. I can sin and then ask for forgiveness later and I'll be forgiven and all will be well. No, that's not the right attitude to have either. And so don't use that freedom that you have been given because under the old law, it was very strict. It was very specific. There were certain rituals that you had to partake in that are not continued under the new law. And so because they have all this freedom, all this liberty that was not so under the law of Moses, he says that there are some people that are using that extra freedom as an excuse to sin or as an excuse to not do the things that they were supposed to do. Well, what's the solution to that? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you just follow that principle, where you put other people's needs ahead of your own, you're going to be working in such a way that is mutually beneficial to both of you, that you can both spiritually mature based on one another's example. And so each person needs to be looking out for the other's interest, and doing that will solve the problem. Well, how do we implement that problem? Because that's really hard to do. And Paul is saying the way to implement it is, if you're sitting there biting one another, eventually you're going to consume one another. And if you keep that in mind, if you remember that your brothers and sisters are there to help you, and that engaging in this kind of back and forth to where you're constantly taking jabs at one another is just destroying you from within, then you're going to remember that and realize sometimes it's better to go back to the golden rule. That's how to implement the solution that he is giving. We cannot use our sin, or sorry, use our freedom as a license to sin because we are freed from those old laws and traditions. See, this was the difference in the old and the new law that Paul is trying to point out here. We had the law of Moses and then the law of the heart. 
the law of Moses dealt largely with the physical world and the actions that we took. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing for, for its time. It served a purpose. For example, Jesus gives a great commentary on this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, it's bad to commit adultery. But if you're looking at women with lust in your eyes, then for you, that's just as bad. Granted, you're not involving anybody else in that, but you are adopting the attitude and the mentality of someone who commits adultery. And that puts you at odds with God just as much as committing the actual act of adultery would be. And so that's really why he's trying to make this contrast between the old law and the new law. He's saying, you have a lot of liberty. You have a lot of freedom that you did not have under the old law. But because you're under the law of the heart, you are now actually held to a higher standard. You have more freedom, but that also means you have more responsibility. You can't just say, well, I'm in accordance with the law because I've never committed adultery. You have to actually commit yourself daily to not even think about it. And that's true when it comes to, for another example that Jesus used, when it came to human relationships. It's bad to murder somebody, but if you're harboring hatred for someone and want terrible things to happen to them and treat them horribly because of that, is that really a whole lot better? You may not be breaking the law of Moses, but you are breaking the law of the heart. You're breaking the intent behind that law that we're supposed to love one another. And so this is really the standard that Paul is giving. Problem, solution, how to implement the solution. If you remember that your brothers and sisters are there to help you, and you look at them as a resource to encourage you to do good, you're not going to be nearly as inclined to attack one another. Because the church, it was true in Paul's day, it's true now. It is under attack from the world. Constantly. It never lets up. It may, you know... It may seem as though it's not happening at sometimes more so than it is others. For example, there's a difference in physical persecution, actually killing Christians that believe, and just persecuting people by making them an outcast. But the point is, it is under constant attack all the time regardless. And if we're not aware of that, if we're busy fighting one another inside the church as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to be ignoring the more serious threat from the outside. We cannot fight as an army if we're too busy fighting each other. And the solution to that, as Paul pointed out, is just to remember the teachings of Jesus Christ, that we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. Stay the course, friends. Hey, if you want all the latest updates to this channel, you need to go ahead and like this video and subscribe using that little notification bell down there. Now, that gets you all the latest updates, political commentary, and any of my Bible classes or studies that I post to this channel. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe that it's because you hate America and hate Jesus, but I can't think of any other reason why you wouldn't subscribe.